We should begin. Shall we begin? Yeah. Okay. Well, yes, first of all, hello and welcome. Um, hello, Kate. Thanks for being here. Uh, so, indeed, thank you for joining us for this session with Kate Maestri, who will be talking about her exhibition at CAA titled Colour in Architecture. Um, obviously, we hope that people will be able to come along and view the exhibition in person. We are open every day until the 19th of September. So if you can come along, please do. Um, Kate will be answering some questions at the end of her talk, but we're going to keep those questions to the end because it's much more simpler. It's much simpler to actually do that in this format. Um, so Kate will speak for about 20 minutes. If you do have any questions, please do write them to us. Uh, there is a Q&A function on the webinar. So if you could send those through, that'd be great. And we will relay those at the end of this session. Um, but without further ado, Kate, over to you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you. So I thought I would start by um, just talking about the larger scale architectural work that I do, uh, just to give some context to the work um, that's in the gallery, the smaller scale pieces. So uh, this piece is, um, it was commissioned by Gateshead Council uh, for the Sage Music Centre in Gateshead in the UK. It's a curved glass balustrade. Um, it curves for 100 metres through the main concourse of the building and then wraps around the two courtyards on the outside for another 100 metres. Um, so I worked closely on this project with the architects, Foster and Partners, and I decided to use this as the kind of main um, illustration of the two things that are really important to me with my work. So. The first is uh, that the work is really fully integrated into the building. And so I want it really to work in harmony with the architecture to kind of be seamless, not an added on piece of art at the end of the project. And in order to do that, very often I'm brought in at the very beginning of a project. So during the planning stage of the project, um, and that way really I can work closely with the architects and the client to make sure that the artwork is really an integral part of the architecture. Uh, and the other point that's um, important uh, within my work is uh, collaboration. So especially for a project this size, collaboration is really important. Um, this piece is designed as a kind of rhythmic, abstracted piece of music. So it's blocks of color that create a rhythm that move through the main concourse of the music centre. So I worked closely with engineers uh, for this project because the, because the whole building is curved, I really wanted the, the glass panels in, uh, in the balustrade to be curved and not faceted, not straight edged. Um, quite a tall order because there are 51 different radii within the concourse. So, um, and also it's structural glass. I didn't want any uprights to interrupt it. I wanted it to be kind of, um, almost like a seamless piece of glass curved sculpture that runs through the, the building. So I worked closely with the engineers. Um, obviously there are 51 different curves in the glass. So we had to work closely with the glass fabricators um, and the company who screen printed the color. Uh, onto the glass. So that's a really good illustration of how um, as a team of specialists you can create something really quite magical uh, and, and how important collaboration is, especially on projects of this size. This piece is um, for, it's a reception for an office development in uh, Portland Square, uh, which is just off, just off the north of Oxford Street. Um, and actually the, the location of this building is amazing. It looks right onto Portman Square. And it struck me that as you move through London, you know, there's lots of high buildings and narrow roads. And especially in this part of London, you come out to these amazing public squares with these huge vistas of sky. And I wanted to bring um, some of that sky, some of that vista in, sweep it in and round into the building. So it's 
in a sense is an abstracted skyscape and it moves you can see from this picture it actually starts on the pavement the design and moves right through into the building um, it's a screen printed ceramic enamel uh, so it uses about 12 different blues and there's a very fine mirror line behind so it just picks up reflection as people move um, in and out of the building and, and around Baker Street and Portman Square and here you can see uh, the mirror the mirror lines that just pick up the reflection um, this piece was or is for um, a development in Hammersmith um, again it's for a reception area and the clients and architects were interested in having something quite warm to uh, contribute to the, the space. So it's quite a large office area. Um, and this piece again is screen printed ceramic enamel um, and it's, it's actually done by hand. So if I go back to this. So there are about four different colours here and um, the screen printing process, the huge pieces of glass are about three metres high by one and a half wide. Um, and I mean, it's incredible, really, the, the company Proto Studios, who uh, developed this process for me, uh, hadn't done it before. And, um, you know, it takes quite a lot to control the colour in that way. And here's a close up. And this this piece also has the mirror pinstripes, which relate to a pattern that's on the outside of the building as well. Um, this piece is for Cambridge University Boathouse uh, on the River Cam. Um, and the, the brief for this was to create something, a screen at the other side of the, the balustrade that you can see is the gym for the rowers. So they wanted some privacy and opposite on the other side of the river is a row of houses. And so they also wanted some privacy. So I wanted to do something um, light and in keeping with the building and the location, but obviously that had some sort of screen privacy as well. Um, and I looked in detail at the rowing, the process of rowing and, and the different um, equipment that you might need for that. And I was really struck by the pattern that the oars make as they move through the water. So I turned it into a linear pattern following the, the stroke of the oars um, and actually just repeated that pattern but the result was really quite pleasing because to me it suggests the pattern you can see in detail here suggests um, like you know water or fountains or sprinkled water um, it has a kind of watery feel uh, which wasn't really the intention at the beginning um, but it was a nice outcome to the project and this is the last architectural one I want to show you, just to show you some, like, the kind of other projects that I work on. Um, this is a glass tower for a building in Victoria, Wilton Plaza in London. Um, and you can see from the detail on the right hand side, it's actually, uh, it houses the lift lobbies on each floor of the building. And uh, so again, I was brought in at the beginning, the planning stage, um, when actually the, the old building that they tore down was still there. And there was a, a beautiful big tree just where you see the white pillar at the front, a big tree and the, the client and the architect um, fought quite hard to save this tree. They wanted you know, it to be part of the new development, but for various reasons, it, it couldn't stay. So I wanted to do some kind of um, like a homage to, you know, as you walk around London, there's millions of trees and you just catch a glimpse through, through two buildings and you see a line of London plane trees in the sky. I wanted to recreate that glimpse uh, through the buildings that you see. So it's an imagined abstracted uh, interpretation of that. So the green is the tree that, that couldn't remain. Um, and then the sky, the blues are the, the skyscape, the changing skyscape behind. Um, and with this project, so there's, as I was saying with the collaboration, there's always lots of different elements to a project. Um, and with this one, it's a south facing tower um, and quite high up and took a lot of sunlight. So I worked quite closely with Pilkington Glass to see how much um, 
sunlight we could diffuse using opaque ceramic enamel. So the artwork, as well as being decorative, actually had a, you know, like a technical function as well for the project. So it's just a super quick flick through um, the architectural work. And now I wanted to talk more about the pieces that are on show in the gallery. Um, so this piece was designed um, as part of a collection inspired by the Barbican in London. It's made from um, the, I don't know how clearly you can see because it's designed to be invisible, but there's a structure, a perspex structure behind the glass. And then the blue glass that you can see is, uh, it's a mouth blown uh, stained glass. It's made by a company in Germany. And it is uh, the kind of stained glass that you have in church windows traditionally and still, it's um, still used in that way. So it's uh, bonded onto the front of the perspex using um, a, an architectural process, uh, which, hopefully, which holds it in place. Um, and I wanted to just touch at this point on um, a kind of underlying quest with my work uh, that, that covers the architectural work and the smaller scale pieces. And it's really um, an ambition to create color that appears to be suspended in space. So with no visible fixings, no visible framework. Um, and with the large scale architectural work, it's surprisingly easy to do that because of modern technology. So you can have huge pieces of glass and um, you know, quite simple hanging structures, but they're all hidden behind the glass. And again, like with uh, the piece in the sage, you know, it's uh, no, no uprights, not, it wasn't faceted. Um, it kind of appears to be floating. And so with brilliant engineers, that's quite easy to achieve. But on the smaller scale pieces, uh, it's everything is visible. You can't hide anything um, with the interior sculptures. So um, it's kind of a, an ongoing uh, development that, uh, that I'm preoccupied with, with my work. And it started when I left college. I took a, a studio at the Oxo Tower on the South Bank and um, I took the studio with a friend and part of that, uh, the complex at the Oxo Tower is you have a studio at the back, but a showroom at the front. So we were like, we're gonna have to create something to sell, create a product. So I made some glass hanging pieces and drilled holes in them and hung them using uh, fishing wire. And but it just, it felt really clunky. So I moved into using Perspex boxes and I sat the glass into grooves at the top and the bottom and glued them in. And, and that still felt, um, you know, quite, the glass was very definitely held in place. You could see how it was held. And so this collection for the Barbican was um, a step forward from that. So the Perspex structure is still there, but the glass, um, I mean, you can't really see how the glass is bonded onto the perspex. There's no grooves and there's no fixings. So this, this collection was in 2008. Um, and that was a step forward in the, the processes that I were use, was using. So uh, this piece or this collection came about because I uh, did a residency at the Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture in London, which sadly, I think, doesn't exist anymore um, and I so I was invited to uh, do some work inspired by their archive and I discovered the archive of J.M. Richards who was the editor of Architectural Review I think through the 40s 50s maybe 60s and he had um, a lot of the original plans and elevations of the Barbican. Um, incredible, incredible drawings. So no photographs, just drawings, um, architectural drawings. And so I, yeah, I chose to work with those. And as you can see from this illustration here, there was a lot of material to work from. Um, and the way that I work usually is, well, usually from photographs or in this case, architectural plans. And I work with collage. So I 
collage coloured paper uh, over the drawings or the photographs to create shapes and patterns that I can then take and, as in this piece, um, you know, construct them into three dimensional pieces. And this piece here is, um, was also designed uh, as this Barbican collection. And it has a, a sister piece that's blue in blues. And I wanted to really talk about colour at this point, because uh, I, so I work with a lot of blues and greens, and there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, one is lots of my work is in the public realm, and to use blues and greens are harmonious colours, they're tranquil, um, and they work with a lot of building materials. They're kind of quite easy and powerful colours to use. Uh, but with the smaller scale pieces, what's really interesting is that the, the Lambert stained glass that I usually work with uh, has huge collections uh, within each colour palette. So you can work with 20 different blues or 30 different greens. And uh, although these pieces are just one colour, um, that's, you know, that's just a really beautiful thing to be able to do. For me, I love to, to have those options. Um, and red, as in ceramics and glass, reds and purples are difficult to get a hold of. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot more uh, scope working with greens and blues. So th this collection um, uses those colours. And the other thing I would say is that, um, so the way that I work is I take lots of photographs. I have a huge archive of photographs. So if I see something that I like the colour of, I record that and I collect it. And very often those are landscapes and seascapes, or sometimes architecture, you know, architectural shapes or patterns that I like. So um, I have a big archive that I can work from uh, as kind of colour studies. And, okay, so this is part of the exhibition. Um, the last two pieces I showed are in the exhibition as well. Um, and so for the exhibition now for CAA, Colour and Architecture, we wanted to do something that placed these wall sculptures in context. So I spoke with People Will Always Need Plates, who I've collaborated with before, and they do amazing uh, architectural drawings on ceramics and um, very often of modernist, you know, brutalist architecture, but they're they're incredibly beautiful. And so they came up with the idea of recreating the Isocon building penthouse from photographs. Um, so they've created this scene. So it's, it's life size, it's huge, it's three meters high by over two meters wide. And, um, and then, so we placed my work above the table. So it's a two dimensional drawing on the wall and the glass is a three-dimensional object that sits on top of that so it creates a, a really amazing and playful context for the work uh, so that's in the gallery and it's really nice to take a, a piece of work that was about the Barbican from a, good, a few years ago um, and sort of reimagine it in the 21st century now. Uh, so the next collection is uh, inspired by the National Theatre, uh, which is right next to the Oxo Tower, where I had a, um, a studio for many years. So I would see it every day in different weathers and different lights. Um, and it's a, a building that I love very much. Uh, and so again, this is uh, made in the same way. It's sandblasted perspex. It's a structure that attaches to the wall. And the, you can see, actually, there's a lot of reflection. You can see the Lambert's stained glass that's bonded onto the front. And the glass is really beautiful. It has a very delicate surface texture that you can see here. And it also has lots of tiny bubbles. So there's a nice juxtaposition between the very hard lines, the very minimal style of the work. But when you get close, there's a warmth um, and a kind of organic texture to the glass. And I really enjoy those, those two differences. 
So stepping away for a minute, this piece um, isn't in the show, but it was also inspired by the National Theatre. So this was for uh, the Crafts Council for Collect Open in uh, 2015, I think. Um, and this piece is made from metal, um, powder coated metal. And it's, it's inspired, so the, the blue piece I just showed here is inspired by the towers uh, across the top of the National Theatre and this piece is inspired by if you just go underneath as if you were going in there's lots of faceted um, beams underneath and I, yeah I spent a long time uh, photographing those and collaging them and this angled piece just shows you the three-dimensional element of this piece of work and okay so this brings me to another collection actually that was shown at CAA for um, in 2011 and it was for Kelmscott Manor so this is William Morris's summer house in Oxfordshire Kelmscott Manor a medieval building it's incredible so I spent some time there and I photographed the inside of the building and the outside and the gardens the gardens were beautiful um, and so the idea was to make a collection of work inspired by the building and the gardens and this, and it was for show at CAA. Um, and this piece is, it's in the window of the current exhibition and it's, it has a sister piece here. And they're really directly inspired by the roofscape of the building. So it has many little turrets. Um, so I photographed those and collaged those. And this piece is made slightly differently. It just has a, a piece of perspex along the back that sits flush with the wall. Um, and then the glass is just gently faceted. So it's not cantilevered like the other pieces. Um, this is about a metre long by 15 centimetres high and the faceted pieces sit about 10 centimetres uh, proud from the wall uh, and this piece is the same. I should say the piece for, I didn't talk about the dimensions, if I just go back away, this piece here is actually, it's, again it's about a metre wide um, and it sits it sits, uh, so the piece in the middle that looks darker sits quite flush to the wall and then it kind of cantilevers out and it at the widest point I think it's about 35 centimeters proud from the wall so it's a really quite highly engineered piece of perspex and the color is all the same but the piece in the middle is darker because it has less light behind so what's really magical about these pieces is as the light during the day changes the feel and the atmosphere of the work changes. It can look quite different um, depending on the time of day. So I'm just going to flick back to Kelmscott Manor. So yes, these two pieces are uh, were made at a later date than the others using the same process of um, bonding the glass to the front of the perspex. And this is a close up where you can see, hopefully, your screen is big enough you can see uh, the texture the bubbles in the glass um, which is re really beautiful and it makes every single piece of glass becomes unique so the way that I work with Lambert's glass is I create a color palette and I send it to them and they mouth blow the glass to match that color palette so so it's individual anyway um, and when they blow, uh, it's not machine rolled. So it finds its own level. So with one piece of glass, they're about 900 by 600. Um, uh, and so one side of the piece of glass can be, when they're blown, can be about four mil thick, so quite deep color. And the other side can be two mil thick. So you have a very um, a much lighter color, but it's one piece of glass. And I really enjoy that, the kind of organic quality of that. Um, and like I said before, but putting it with uh, these very geometric designs. Um, this was also designed for Kelmscott Manor. And this was taken from photographs of the incredible garden and the amazing foliage. They've got really high brick walls around the garden um, and the foliage just kind of tumbles down everywhere. Um, so this is, yeah, this is taken from photographs and, and drawings and collages of 
of the of the greenery and the foliage in the garden. And this piece is um, so again. This has been reimagined for the collaboration with people that will always need plates for this show now at CAA. Um, and this yellow piece, I love this piece, and it's designed. Uh, well, it's inspired by in the garden of Kelmscott Manor was the most incredible flower. I didn't find its name, um, but it's kind of like a big, like a flying saucer, like a big flat, bright yellow flower. It was incredible. Um, so this piece is inspired by those flowers, and it's a kind of. Uh, it, the idea is that it's all, it's it's supposed to be hung low on the wall, so it's not as high as the other pieces. And the idea is that it's almost like a bunch of flowers that have been gathered from the garden, put into a vase and put on a side table or on a mantelpiece. Um, yes, yeah, so it has a different feel from the other work. And uh, again, highly engineered because it stands proud from the wall by about 30 centimetres, uh, just with a piece of one piece of glass across the front. And okay, so this brings me to my new collection. So the, the work that's in the show that I've shown you so far is really from my archive. Um, but I wanted to make some new pieces for the exhibition. And uh, I'm just, okay, so this is one of the new pieces. And so, so as I said, there's like an ongoing quest to create this colour that's just uh, free and suspended in space without any visible framework. And so um, I was, I've was i been thinking for a long time, how do I move that on from the perspex structures, which are really beautiful and really work, but still very highly engineered. And I, I wanted to be able to just take a piece of coloured glass and just place it, you know, so it, it wasn't fixed to anything. And I looked at lots of different possibilities using lots of different techniques. Um, and there are, there are lots of, there are lots of possibilities, but I settled on a very simple wooden um, wall plinth. You can just see that in the photograph, actually, it's all so white, it almost disappears, which is kind of what I wanted. Um, so the, the plinths are designed to sit completely flush with the wall. And you can't see from the photograph, but uh, there's, they're made from two pieces of wood and the back piece of wood sits slightly lower than the front piece. So it just catches the edge of the glass um, and stops it falling forward. So the glass is literally just picked up, placed on top of the plinth and it leans back against the wall uh, just a slight bit. Um, and yeah, so the, really the aim, the aim for these was to, to get rid of any framework at all. Um, and I also looked at having the plinths in perspex, which are, are beautiful because they can transmit the light through them, the sort of frosted perspex. Um, but for these new pieces, I wanted to use wood, which has been just painted white. Um, and it really started, so I discovered this building, which I haven't seen in real life, I have to say, which is the first time, I think it's actually the first time I've worked from something, from a bit, just a photograph, not a building that I know. Um, and I just thought it was so beautiful. So it's a church in France, um, and, and incredible. And I love the way the bells are just set to one side. Uh, and this is the, the other view of it. So, Again, it's the same process. I collage with coloured paper and create shapes and patterns. Um, and eventually it became this. Um, and so this new series of work I'm about to show you, uh, yeah, well, I should mention that the, the smaller scale work is, it's very much um, a sort of experimental process in terms of colour and form that really then goes on to inform the larger scale work. So I see these pieces as maquettes or, you know, like 3D models um, in terms of colour and form that, that I can refer back to. They're experiments, you know, that can uh, inform the bigger public artworks. And so this new collection are 
are, are color studies, really. They're color studies and shape studies. And obviously they're artworks in their own right, but they're the beginning of a new conversation, I think, looking maybe at new colors and new shapes. And it's, um, it's a very personal way of doing it. You know, I don't rely on engineers and I'm not relying on big architectural glazing firms or art glass fabricators. I can just uh, create these myself and play around with color and form. And this piece is the, is the sister piece to the one I just showed you. So the little yellow square on the side standing alone is, represents the bells that were just standing alone from the main building. Um, and the other building I've been looking at uh, for, for the new work that I've been very preoccupied with is this, which is the um, Museum uh, of National Uprising, Sabakian so National Uprising, and uh, it's an incredible building. So there are lots of different views, but just to give you a feel of, um, so I've been playing around with this shape and collaging and um, it didn't turn out how I imagined it was going to actually, but it was interesting. Um, and this is a, a triptych that has been inspired by that building. Uh, and again, it's a new kind of new color ways, new color study. Um, and it's interesting. This is all five pieces together of the new work. I think it's interesting for me because it is like a, the beginning of a new conversation and I'm interested to see where that will go. So for these smaller pieces, I often do commissions for people's homes or um, hotels or, um, and you know, that's sort of just a really lovely way to work because it's more intimate, especially if it's a commission for somebody's home. Um, and I feel like this is, this has a long way to go. So the plinths can be different sizes and different scales. They can be different colorways, um, inspired by different things. So uh, it's been a really lovely opportunity to be able to make some new work for the show and um, yeah, and, and see where that, where that goes. So that's it, thank you. Shall I go back to, do you want me to leave the, the PowerPoint on? So, so for now, I think that would be a good idea, Kate. Okay. Yes, leave, leave it off. Okay. Um, so we've got a couple of questions here. Mm -hmm. um, the first is, where did you study and become interested to work architecturally with glass? So, um, so I studied a public art degree at Chelsea School of Art um, and it, unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore but it was an amazing degree and we worked with lots of different materials so we worked with wood, plastic, metal, glass, mosaic, um, textiles and, um, and, and then specialised, so I specialised in glass and I then went on to do a, an MA in public art at Chelsea, which was much more theory based. And it was around the time uh, Percent for Art had really taken off in the States and was just beginning to come to the UK. So it was a really interesting time to be looking at public art and thinking about what is public art? What does it mean? And, and um, you know, what kind of future does it have? And then I went to Central St. Martins and studied architectural glass, which really took me back into being a maker and introduced me to, um, well, I mean, on the degree, because it was public art, everything that you designed was always uh, designed, you know, for a location, for a building um, or for uh, a, the public realm. So really I've always thought of my work as being large scale and, um, yeah, so I went to Central St. Martins to do a postgrad, and that was just to really make stuff again. So we were making glass and learning lots of different techniques there. And then I left there and, and took a studio at the Oxo Tower. Thank you very much. Um, got quite a few questions coming in now. Okay. So I'm going to do them in the order they're coming in. So. Um, the next one, how do you see the relationship between your architectural commissions and your smaller scale pieces and how do they inform each other? Um, 
Well, for me, there's, there is obviously scale is a thing and, um, and the smaller ones I have more control over and the larger ones they're made for me by the people. But I really don't see the process as terribly different. I mean, the way that I work is, as I've said, I, I work from photographs, I use collage, everything is site specific. So on a large scale project, I would consider the architecture of the building that it's going into, um, the history of the building maybe, the future use of the building or the local area. You know, so all of those things um, are considered in the final design. And, and so the final piece for the architectural work is always site specific. Um, and I feel that the smaller pieces are too, especially if they're commissioned. You know, if they're commissioned for somebody's home or for a, um, a hotel or something, uh, they always are site specific. So if it's somebody's home, I will go and visit them and we'll, you know, we'll talk about, maybe look at their garden, maybe it will be inspired if they've got an incredible house, it will be inspired by that, or it will be color led, you know, it will be about color. Um, so these, these pieces uh, still are inspired by architecture. They're still site specific, uh, I feel, just in a different way from the large scale work. So I feel they're kind of seamless there. They work together really well, the two schemes. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, we've got a question about private commissions for the home and how does that work with your gallery? Um, well, so if somebody is interested in a commission, obviously they come to you, come to CAA, um, and then, then you will facilitate, uh, you know, uh, we would meet and um, usually I would go to somebody's house although in the current climate I'm not quite sure <laughs> how that would work um, but I would go to somebody's house and we would yeah we, uh, we would have a conversation about where they wanted the work for instance I did a project a while ago for somebody who had um, an incredible flat that looked down onto the Thames and obviously they loved that, you know, the view every day, seeing the river. And so I did a whole, a huge wall piece for them that was completely inspired by um, the river and photographs of the river and the sparkle of the light. Um, and that actually worked beautifully with the glass uh, because of the surface texture picked up the sparkle. So they're always different, but the process is really the same, that I go to somebody's house or I meet with them or we speak on Zoom and, um, talk to them about what they want and then I would come up with some designs and glass samples and then we would talk through that and maybe we would tweak that slightly um, until there's a final design that's been agreed and then I would make it and install it. Thank you. A um, couple more. How do you take into account the projecting shadows of your pieces for the smaller pieces when creating them? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> the really honest answer is I don't. I don't actually because um, what's most important to me is the, the physical form. So the actual structure of the glass is the thing that I'm trying to achieve. But what's really beautiful is when you've hung it, um, you suddenly discover these incredible shadows. And with all of them, you know, they, they have their own kind of second life through the shadows that they create. But that's really quite arbitrary. I mean, that's just controlled by the lighting in the studio or the gallery and, um, and the form. So it's a, that's an organic process that I, I don't consider when I'm designing, but that I really enjoy. I enjoy them, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, right, a two part question here, it looks like. Is there a difference in your approach to designing for the small scale domestic and the large scale architectural projects? Um, I'm going to let you answer that first, I think. Okay. Is, it, <laughs> is there a difference? Did, what, is there a, sorry, is there a difference in your approach to designing for the small scale domestic and the large scale architectural projects? Um, yes, definitely, because the the large scale, just the structure of how a large scale project is run. So, um, you know, it's I collaborate with so many different parties. So, and also, you know, I have a brief. So the architects are saying to me, 
quite often, although sometimes it's quite free, um, you know, we want something here and what do you think? And, um, you know, I'm given a space and there are certain parameters that I have to keep within because it's a building first and foremost that, you know, is being made for somebody. Um, but I enjoy that. I do. I enjoy that element of having a brief and collaborating with the client and the architect. Um, with the small scale pieces to commission, it's different because it's just a conversation between me and the client. Um, and you know, if it's going into somebody's home, it's um, it's more intimate, probably. You know, it's a it's a, a more gentle relationship and conversation. Whereas on a large scale project, you're considering, you know, can this literally be built? Like, can an engineer actually help me realize what it is that I want to make? And there's there's other considerations that don't come into the the smaller pieces. Yeah, I hope that kind of answers the question. Um, and finally, I believe, um, what would be your dream building to produce a piece for? Well, um, well, any beautiful building, um, really. But I would, I would like to do a church or a cathedral. You know, a big, huge, um, beautiful window for maybe maybe a contemporary church. Yeah, that would be quite nice. We'll see. <laughs> uh, right. Well, that's, I believe, all the questions we have. Yes. Any more? Well, I'm just checking that you are on. No. Um, so, thank you, Kate. It's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, Really interesting. Thank you so much for presenting that. Uh, as we said before, the show is open until next Saturday, the 19th of September. Please do come along. We're open 11 till 6 every day. You will find the work you've seen on screen um, and be able to experience those in 3D. And they are available to purchase in the gallery. Or, of course, we can make appointments for you to talk to Kate if you would like to talk about the commissioning process and we can facilitate that for you if you aren't able to come into the gallery. Any which way we can help you. Um, and if you did want more information about coming into the gallery, then please do email us. We can send you images and further information should you require that. Um, but most of all, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. Uh, it's not something we do regularly. And so I hope you've enjoyed it. And huge thanks to Kate, really appreciate you being able to do this today, it's really interesting. Um, and thank you. I just need two more questions. Oh, two more questions. <laughs> okay, are you able to take two more questions? Yes, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so have you ever considered creating objects that could be used on a daily basis as well as being looked at? Hmm. No, not not really. No, I mean, when I first moved to the Oxo Tower, and um, as I said, we had to have products that we could sell in the showroom. And actually, it was part of the beginning of this um, desire to have colour just floating. I made some freestanding pieces of glass. So they were in perspex blocks, sandblasted perspex blocks with grooves in the middle, and then decorative glass that just sat um, sat in there, so kind of floated in there. And I did sell those, actually. I sold those to, to quite a few people, quite a lot of shops and things. And the aim of those was that they could, they were window pieces, so you could sit them in the window. Um, and obviously you could move them around um, on the mantelpiece. Um, but that's not really a use. And my guess is that's not quite what you meant by use. Um, no, I haven't, I haven't designed anything that has a function. Um, in that sense, no, not yet. Not yet, exactly, <laughs> early days. <laughs> We're only 20 years in, Kate. Yeah, good time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that the National Theatre is one of your favorite buildings. Are you a fan of brutalism or do you have any other favorite architectural styles or periods? Um, I am a huge fan of brutalism. Yes, I am. I've always loved that style. Um, aesthetically, 
uh, I find it very pleasing. I love concrete and um, yeah, I, I really do. And it just, I find it very inspiring, uh, those buildings. Um, but there's another, there's another element to them that I really like as well, that they, so they, in the UK, you know, the kind of uh, like the Barbican and the National Theatre, and they were part of this sort of time of optimism um, and, you know, towards a utopia and society was getting better and was changing and they were modern and uh, futuristic. And I think that, that, you know, that's really important to have that kind of feel to architecture that is it's um, expressing that so i like that element of it as well but but i love architecture so i'm i'm open to all styles well within reason um but no particularly i i, I enjoy uh, yeah brutalism modernist architecture and it really inspires my work so it's great yeah The end of the questions. Okay. So, finally, thank you so much, Kate. It's been such a privilege to have you give us such an inspiring talk. Um, so, hopefully, we'll see some people in the gallery over the next week. Hopefully, you'll all be able to come along. Um, but for now, thank you so much for joining us. And goodbye. Bye.